Hi everyone, my name is Serene Jung and I'm an Associate Professor in Implementation Science at the Global Centre for Preventive Health and Nutrition at Deakin University, Australia. I'm really excited today to speak about methods and designs for uh, studying skill up. Um, today I hope to cover the following. This will be a bit of an express overview of the designs you could choose to understand skill up. Um, I also want to discuss some of the practicalities that you might have to keep in mind when selecting or applying these designs. Um, and I hope to reflect on an example that our team undertook of an efficacy to scale up evaluation. Um, and lastly, I'll uh, provide um, a few things that you may be able to look at when you're thinking about assessing the quality of scale up studies. I'm sure you all appreciate that the study of scale up uh, is often opportunistic and things can happen that are out of the control of a researcher or a research team. So there's not a one size fits all approach. I hope by the end of this, it gets you thinking about how you may be able to apply such designs to answer your particular skill up questions within your context uh, and what the practicalities are of understanding this in the real world. Before moving into the designs, I thought it would be worth uh, defining skill up again. I know you're all familiar with these definitions, but being really explicit um, upfront is really important in thinking about design right up and helps you to really be sure that you're studying skill up. Uh, at its core, the uh, study of skill up um, involves a program, a, a intervention or a product that has been tested at a smaller scale. Uh, you're looking to both expand and replicate that product. Um, and the intent is to reach more people and broaden its impact. Um, and typically, there's an element of ongoing delivery and impact um, to, to the broader um, target audience. Uh, once you're, you have identified that you're studying skill up, uh, the first thing really to be sure about is to be clear about your skill up question as this will guide your selection of study designs. And what do I mean by that? McGinty um, and colleagues, they um, provide a really useful guide for thinking about questions and study designs. And briefly, your questions might be a descriptive one where you're looking to describe perceptions um, or available resources for scale up. Uh, you might be interested in predictive or association questions. What factors might predict successful scale up or influence scale up? Or are you interested in causal questions? Typically, there's evidence of efficacy or effectiveness when you're looking at what strategies are useful to improve um, outcomes. Uh, really defining this question is so important so that you're not employing study designs that are um, inappropriate or may not be needed. Often, there will tend to be more than one question um, and articulating this as clearly as possible helps you with thinking through what you need to do and what outcomes you may need to collect. So in the next couple of slides, I will outline some study designs to answer each of the possible questions. I won't go through the characteristics of this in detail. Um, I understand you've already been introduced to implementation science studies in module five of the eHub fundamental programs, uh, but I will um, address some of the research questions you might be able to answer and pull up um, some of the designs that may be a bit newer to um, some, some in the room. Um, and so the first, type of question you might have are descriptive questions. They help to uh, characterize the scale up process uh, or understand stakeholder perceptions to scale up. Um, they're usually hypothesis generating and are describing um, scale up implementation at one time point. Uh, so descriptive studies don't usually have a control group as you would be aware. Um, some of the questions that you might answer with some of these designs um, are what are the barriers to scale up? Uh, what are preferences for strategies to support scale up? What's currently being done um, to support scale up? And you might use qualitative, um, quantitative surveys, document reviews, mixed methods approaches to 
answer some of these questions. Um, I will point out uh, the application of some of the dimension reduction approaches, which are really statistical approaches to identify how things group together or cluster. Um, so in scale up, this might be particularly useful uh, because you know, characteristics or strategies are not often delivered in isolation. So there might be grouping or certain combinations that go together. And some of these approaches can help you look at similar characteristics or structures that can uh, promote scale up um, once an intervention has already been scaled up. Um, so that might be something useful to consider when you do see an intervention being scaled up and there are data points to um, consider how they might cluster together. Um, for predictive or association questions, uh, they look to assess what structures, strategies, factors can predict scale up outcomes. Uh, these studies are usually also uncontrolled. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of these designs here, um, which may be really useful when you have existing data. Uh, the first type of um, approach is the regression approach. I think many will be familiar with this. Uh, this is a linear logistic regression. Uh, you can collect the data, usually in longitudinal studies, to help um, support that predictive uh, question. Uh, and you tend to pre-specify um, a predictive variable uh, and um, a dependent variable, uh, which is usually your scale-up outcome. Um, and in regression approaches, you uh, like to be able to prospectively specify those variables to prevent uh, really just identifying spurious associations. Um, increasingly, where there is data available, like administrative data or health records, um, you may be able to use this uh, machine learning approaches to uh, do predictive analysis of structures and strategies that can increase scale up in particular areas or among particular organizations. Um, machine learning approaches are usually completely data driven. Um, so they give you a bit more ability to predict uh, perhaps non-linear associations or more complex associations, but uh, there's no coefficients like regression models. So they're often a little bit more difficult to understand or interpret. Um, and lastly, there are system science methods. Um, this may be system dynamics modeling or agent-based modeling, um, and they allow um, the ability to understand uh, interdependence and feedback loops, which is really important in scale up, um, where we know different components are interrelated. Um, system dynamics methods, for example, we do use an element of participatory approach uh, to support the model building, uh, use that model to guide data collection and then the data to support quantitative modeling. Uh, and this gives you the ability to predict how different factors within the system can interact with the system more broadly. Uh, some of the challenges of this data, as you would expect with these designs, are the availability of data and really defining uh, the variables in a measurable way and collecting that data. Um, I also want to note that these methods are not uh, typically used to make causal inferences, um, potentially just due to uh, confounding where um, a variable that is unmeasured may be the actual predictor. Um, and clearly there's some advanced methods um, here as well. It's often important to check in with experts in the area and a statistician uh, prior to using some of these methods. And lastly, um, I want to cover causal questions. And I think these are the designs that are that are perhaps we may be most familiar with. Um, so causal questions are those that seek to establish causalities, not associations. Um, they give us evidence of efficacy or effectiveness. Um, and they can do that by establishing temporality where the strategies or the um, structures need to be in place prior to measuring follow-up outcomes. Uh, there is the randomized control trial um, and also non-randomized experimental trials. Um, randomization is useful to help address some of the confounding that uh, we spoke about in the previous uh, study designs, but they may be really challenging in scale-up designs. So you may need to consider randomizing um, 
just the timing of scale up or just different jurisdictions there might slightly that a clustered design uh, will be needed if you're able to randomize. Uh, there are other non-experimental methods as well, natural experiments, time series um, designs, non-randomized methods, I mean, um, time series designs, um, and different types of statistical uh, designs that can help um, address some of the confounding in the non-randomized designs. Uh, there are also other things to consider when you're selecting scale-up designs, and these are covered in more detail in other lectures, um, but um, I think it's important that I uh, bring them up here uh, as really the selection of study design um, needs to take into account some of the practicalities and challenges with studying scale-up, um, so they're likely to influence your design decisions. Um, so most um, scale-up efforts in health are unplanned. So when you're thinking of designs, there's value on really understanding what's being scaled up, um, perhaps using a more flexible approach, descriptive design to still answer some questions of interest while you know noting um, some of the limitations of some of those designs. Uh, some flexibility may also be needed um, if um, you expect an intervention or a program to be adapted as it's being rolled out and um, need to capture those decisions. Um, we spoke about this uh, in, I spoke about this in the previous slides that really a lot of scale up design is influenced by um, having the appropriate and relevant outcome data um, and what you are able to do with that data. And critically, uh, having stakeholder engagement and interest really in scaling up uh, and the evaluation process uh, is likely to be a, a significant factor in your ability to uh, design particular um, evaluation approaches um, and to get buy-in in lots of the processes that are needed to formally evaluate a scale-up process. Um, and lastly, um, just reinforcing a point that I brought up earlier, there are often challenges with getting controlled evaluations if scale-up is um, encompasses an entire jurisdiction um, or there's no opportunity to identify control participants prior to a program being um, rolled out. I wanted to also speak really quickly about um, a scale-up study and an implementation study. Uh, so in the literature, um, there have been different conceptualizations of scale-up studies. Some have used uh, numbers, for example, more than 50 sites included, um, or an entire jurisdiction, whether it's local, um, state, national, uh, to uh, conceptualize scale-up. Um, others have also drawn in the idea of embedding and a shift in systems that uh, mean a more permanent embedding of a program into practice, uh, regardless of the size. Um, and there's this helpful diagram here by uh, Heather McKay and colleagues, which highlights that scale up seats amongst a continuum. Um, and what they propose here is um, as we continue to evaluate scale up, you move away from focusing on uh, measuring health outcomes and delivery of the core components of the intervention to looking at how well implementation strategies are delivered um, and measuring the extent in which the intervention is delivered to the target population. And so what this might look like is you may no longer closely look at the health data, but you might look at how well uh, some of the training um, to deliver a program is delivered. Um, and instead of understanding whether the core components of an intervention is delivered, um, you might look at um, just how people report adopting a particular program or intervention. I wanted to give a quick example of uh, my team's experience studying scale up. Um, initially, we developed an online menu planning um, website that supported childcare providers to plan menus consistent with the nutrition guidelines. Um, in our efficacy evaluation, we undertook a hybrid um, study to look at efficacy of the implementation strategies as well as impact on child health. Um, 
based on really positive findings from both of those, we were interested in understanding how to get the intervention out more broadly to childcare services uh, in Australia. Um, so here we undertook a descriptive study to examine which factors influenced um, adoption and scale up of a particular program. Uh, lastly, we ran a pilot non-randomized control trial to study um, what increased adoption of the intervention uh, and whether the scale-up strategy that we designed um, did increase adoption of the program. And some of the things that influenced our scale-up selection was a real appetite by funders to scale up the program, uh, the availability of analytics from uh, the online program to provide indication of adoption, um, and the staggered rollout of the program that let us have also a concurrent control group. Uh, on this slide, I just have a couple of things that you might want to consider when looking at skill up studies. Um, they align with a lot of things that I've spoken about previously already. Um, and I want to highlight that um, whatever decision you make, um, it really just is important to justify um, why uh, in terms of uh, bringing readers along um, so that um, your decisions can be understood more broadly. Um, to summarize, uh, have a clear scale up aim. Um, this will really inform study design selection. If you have a descriptive scale up study, you do not need to run a randomized control trial. Um, there's often a need to straddle really practicalities and opportunistic um, scale up with optimal study designs. Um, and be sure to just keep a really close record of any justifications, any design decisions uh, you make when studying the scale up. Um, this is some of the references I drew on. In particular, the McGinty study is really worth um, having a read of. Thank you very much.